Okay, I think we are ready to get started. My name is Charles Zona, and I would like to welcome everyone to today's Macron Group webinar. Our presenter is Joe Barabee of Barabee and Associates. Joe is going to talk to us about what is scientific imaging and why is it special. Before we get started, I would like to tell you a little bit about Joe's background and experience. Joe worked for more than 24 years at Macron Associates as a senior research microscopist and director of scientific imaging. His analytical duties include the analysis of art objects, such as paintings and prints, ancient documents and historical and archeological artifacts. And he's used a variety of analytical tools to analyze these specimens, including polarized light microscopy, scanning electron microscopy with X-ray spectrometry, infrared and Raman spectroscopy, and other analytical methods as appropriate. He has performed forensic document examinations, including forged and altered documents, paper, ink, and toner comparisons, writing sequence determinations, and printing process identification. His scientific imaging specialties include photomacrography and photomicrography and invisible radiation photography. Joe also teaches courses at Hook College of Applied Sciences, including pigment identification, photomicrography and scientific imaging, and printing process identification. After the presentation, Joe will field questions from the audience and this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Macron Group website under the Webinars tab. And now I will hand the program over to Joe. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, all, and welcome to the Hook College of Applied Sciences webinar, What is Scientific Im Imaging and Why is it Special? I'm Joe Barabee, and it'll be my pleasure to share some thoughts on this subject with you today. Just how this topic was chosen may be of some interest. Some months ago, the Hook folks asked, asked me to develop a workshop on photomicrography. After considerable discussions, we decided to enlarge the topic a bit and call it photomicrography and scientific imaging. In this class, the emphasis will be on photomicrography, which is photography through the microscope, but we will also include photomacrography, special subject illumination, and other scientific imaging techniques. I should mention that uh, before coming to Macron, I was a medical photographer for 10 years, and previous to that, I was a commercial photographer. At one point, I had a bit of an epiphany. I came across the short public, uh, publication by Kodak called Photomacrography by H. Lou Gibson. And after reading it, I felt called to make photomacrography and microscopy my career direction. I did that and it was a good fit. So what do we mean by scientific imaging? How does it differ from conventional photography? Conventional photography covers a lot of ground from casual snapshots to professional wedding and portrait photography, commercial catalog and advertising, fine art, and the like. With the invention of smart uh, phone cameras, uh, photographs have become an integral part of our daily lives. Not only are we recording significant moments in our, on our, with our phones, but we're also using our phones to gather information. And this leads us to what scientific imaging is all about, information. Scientific images are data. Scientific images are produced within a scientific discipline for a scientific purpose. The subject matter uh, of an image is essentially scientific. It may be a picture of an object, such as the inkwell uh, from an archeological site, or a, photo micro, or a photomicrograph of a cross-section taken from that inkwell. In addition to scientific subject matter, um, the images may involve scientific instrumentation. 
uh, such as microscopes, telescopes, or other instruments. Even if done for aesthetic reasons, such, uh, such as photomicrographs, they still qualify as scientific images. The, image, the imaging uh, energy can be photons, uh, such as with the light microscope, or electrons, as in the scanning electron microscope or in ultrasound waves, which have given expected parents such joy in seeing their developing child. Some of the fields utilizing this technique uh, include uh, 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 medicine, biology, astronomy, archaeology and paleontology, mineralogy and geology. The list goes on. My own experiences in medicine, industrial and forensic microscopy, and in art documents and historical objects conservation. We'll look at example from a number of examples uh, from a number of applications. Let's take another look at that inkwell images, those inkwell images. The challenge was to determine whether this first century inkwell was bone or degraded ivory. The cross section image indicates that the Haversian canals are rounded, not flat, thus confirming bone. Also, a scientific image is all about information or, visit or visual data. Nevertheless, scientific imaging does have its own aesthetic uh, criteria of a sort. And within each scientific field, certain criteria apply as to what an image should include and how it should be made. The visual data represented in the photomicrograph was important in the analysis of this bending bronze casting. The thick red cuprite corrosion layer revealed through a polished and etched cross section was key to determining the object's probable authenticity. Note also that imaging is only one of many analytical techniques employed in the analysis. The aesthetic properties guiding scientific images differ somewhat from those we employ in creating conventional photographs. The entire purpose is to present the data with unambiguous clarity. No fancy compositions, just the subject matter centered within the field on a clear background. What is permissible, however, are any standards that might add information to the image. In this case, the scale, which was photographed with the subject in this particular case. This, doc this documentation of a ricocheting bullet exemplifies many of the characteristics of a well-made scientific, scientific image in the non-medical realm. It includes a scale for size. In this case, the scale was included in the original image. Also, the subject was placed on translucent plastic, which was transilluminated sufficiently to eliminate any distracting shadows. The subject was illuminated to show the morphology of the bullet and the specific striations resulting from the ricochet. The subject occupies most of the entire frame and all of the lines are straight. This was photographed on four by five inch film with a high quality macro lens. Thus, it is of high informational value in an attractive image. Scientific images should be of high informational value. The photographic equipment should be of the highest quality affordable for the laboratory. A professional quality FX format camera and high quality macro lenses might be one approach each specialty has on, uh, uh, but each specialty has its own criteria. As mentioned above, scales are often used to communicate object size and magnification. The, let's take a few minutes to look at a few that I use in my own work. Other disciplines will use others. The choice of a scale will often uh, be dictated by your application. These short, um, inexpensive rulers actually provide a lot of useful information and are widely used in medical, forensic, and industrial applications. It provides rulers uh, in both centimeters and inches, a neutral white or gray for color balance and density, and cross circles for, photogram uh, for photogrammetric use. In recent years, the x rite color checker has found a home in my camera bag. While not as compact, it includes a huge amount of information. In addition to a scale in centimeters, 
It includes a six swatch grayscale for tonal values and CMY and RGB and other color references. The calibrated light gray field is perfect for custom white balancing in the field. For photographing cultural artifacts such as paintings, sculptures, and historical objects, the American Institute for Conservation PhD targets are invaluable. They include scales for size in both centimeters and inches, a six swatch gray scale, blue, green, red, and yellow magenta cyan color references, and a shadow pin with, photogra with photometric arc, arc indicators. It is also well suited for ultraviolet fluorescence photography and includes a magnetic plate, unseen but off to the right in the illustration, for insertion of date and other artifact information. In the case of microscopy, digital photography has a major advantage over film. It is easy to create scale bars for insertion into the image. For this, we must calibrate our microscopes to the software we are using or our photomicrographic method. For this, we need a size standard, a stage micrometer. The one I have is microphotographically etched, a one millimeter ruler with 100 subdivisions, each 10 micrometers in length. 1,000 micrometers is equal to one millimeter. Using this standard, we can calibrate our microscopes and create a scale bar for each objective and even eye photo eyepieces if available. The scale bar included in this uh, uh, paint cross section was created by calibrating my microscope to the stage micrometer image and placed uh, into the image using Adobe Photoshop. Medical photography and imaging, including X radiography and sonography, has a long history. Protocols have been established for poses and camera positions um, and even illumination. As an example, virtually all standard cranial photography is positioned by the Frankfurt plane. This allows comparisons over time. The Frankfurt plane is, de is defined as a line from the top of the tragus of the ear to the top of the infraorbital ridge. A good example of this is in this eye motility series. This can be repeated time after time, allowing the physician to see the progression of the condition or the effective, effectiveness of the treatments. Sticking with such a protocol enables repeatability. Another important application of this method includes before and after cosmetic surgery documentation. This, this image here looks like a conventional photomicrograph, but it's not. This is from a photomacrographic series of images of a pediatric heart defect taken at about three times magnification, too low for use with the compound microscope. It was made with a simple microscope, a single objective lens on a bellows camera. A condenser transilluminator was used to provide maximum contrast and resolution. It was one of a series of slices. The resulting transparencies all had to be exactly the same magnification and exposure and in roughly the same position. This was a difficult project resulting in precise, demanding precise alignment of the optics and exacting calibration before photographing the entire series. Another somewhat exotic application comes from the uh, field of forensic document examination. This is not my project, but it illustrates the value of infrared luminescence to detect alterations in a document. A less exotic example from the in, uh, industrial quality control world is this use of coaxial reflected illumination to document a printing defect. This image confirms that the source of the defect was a droplet, probably water, that led to a series of events resulting in the swelling and bursting through the ink layer. Coaxial illumination, this is reflected uh, coaxial illumination, provides excellent information regarding surface irregularities. Perhaps my most famous project was helping to create an image of every frame of Abraham Zapruder's eight millimeter film 
of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. These images were used to reconstruct a complete film of the assassination, including slow motion and in large portions that could be conveniently analyzed. Here was the strategy. Photograph every frame in its entirety from sprocket holes to, uh, uh, to the edges, including all the information, including those around the sprocket holes, using four by five inch film designed for transparency duplication. Three sheets of film were made of each image. Include a millimeter scale in each image. Include a standard for color balance and density. In this case, a 0 0.60 Rattan neutral density filter was placed in every frame. Include a sequence number within each image so we knew exactly where we were on the film itself. Also include the visual information on both sides of the frame. Image redundancy. In case a frame was missed, the information could be duplicated from these redundant images. This strategy would be useful today, but a high quality digital approach would more likely be employed. In 1996 though, sufficient quality was not available and also the ease with which digital can be altered was a significant issue in our planning. The next images are from a recent project from my own laboratory. In addition to analyzing the paints in the painting, the painting was fully documented photographically, including invisible radiation imagery. The, the work was originally photographed with balanced illumination at one-to-one -one contrast ratio for even lighting. The varnish on the painting was pooled in many areas and highly reflective, so the painting was also photographed with, with cross-polarized light. Cross-polarized light does result in an overly contrasty image, so it should only be used as an alternative to the standard image. But here, it made the painting elements a little more visible. The effectiveness of cross-polarized light is mostly obviously effective in the signature, almost unreadable in ordinary light. But notice how minimizing the reflections with cross-polarized illumination makes the signature much more readable. Photographing it with ultraviolet illumination, being careful to absorb the reflected ultraviolet by use of an ultraviolet absorbing filter, a retin uh, 2H in this case, allows us to see uh, uh, and record only the fluorescence, which would show us recent restorations of dark spots. None, uh, none in these particular images, but note the fluorescent portions from the AIC PhD reference. Uh, this was all part of the scale's design. So the, you can see in the, in the scale, uh, the white lines and the orange lines are ultraviolet fluorescing, and that gives, provides uh, further information on this image. Photographing the, paint, the painting with a camera modified for infrared photography allows us to see up to 950 nanometers. Infrared radiation penetrates many paint films, allowing us to see pentimenti and other ways the painting looked while being transformed into the painted surface we see today. Notice how different the figures appear in this view. Here's the regular view again. X-rays are also high energy, very short wave electromagnetic uh, radiation, and provide information about the density of the paint pigments. We can see the great difference between the lead white seen in the very light areas in the painting and the zinc white with much lower densities. In this view, the horse painted with zinc white has disappeared. Note also a change in the position of the sun or moon. Finally, a great deal can be learned about the, the, an artist's technique and materials by examining a cross section of the paint layers. In this painting, uh, raking light illumination provides information about the texture of the painted surface, and in this case shows that the painting was altered. 
the figure's right shoulder was originally draped, then painted over. This was confirmed in the x-ray of the painting. Just for fun, why might we classify a photo of a signed football as a scientific image? Perhaps when that football is a historical object and the project assignment included restoring the flattened football, identifying all of the signatures on the ball, and determining the year all of those players were on the team. Also, the object presented several photographic challenges. The signatures were made more readable by photographing the object with TechPan, a high contrast film, with a Rattan 25 red filter to lighten the ball and using cross polarized light to manage reflections, which otherwise would have obs obscured the signatures. It turned out that the ball was signed by Newt Rockney on the other side of the lacing and the names coincided with his Notre Dame team, the 1929 national champions. Finally, we should note that scientific image, imaging practices can be used to create images in which the aesthetic value is as important as the information gathered, or at least of some importance. The cover, the cover illustration was produced as a fusion preparation of metal and hydroquinone, two photographic developing agents with a polarizing light microscope using cross-polarized light with a first-order compensator. We mentioned the camera phones, that camera phones are ubiquitous. When I purchased my own, my very first image was through the microscope of one of my favorite pigments, emerald green. I use it on my business card. So thank you so much for your attention and I invite your questions. So um, let's, uh, let's start in on the questions here. We have one from Ken. Uh, do you ever use photo stacking for increasing depth of field? Ken, that's a great question. And yes, I do. I probably should have had an example of it in this, in this talk. Uh, I use it on a pretty regular basis. Uh, and uh, uh, it's pretty easy to do uh, for those of you that have never tried it. Uh, my mind is a blank right now as to what the the software I use, uh, Holosun, that's it. And the you simply make a series of photographs all at precisely the same magnification, but working your way through the 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 uh, focal plane uh, through the through the uh, the subject matter, the three dimensional subject matter, making sure that you have within your depth of field. Uh, uh, good images throughout the, throughout the whole thing. Usually I use in, 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 my, in my microscopy uh, roughly a one millimeter, one micrometer difference between a, a group of, of, uh, of images and then they are pieced together uh, in the software going by the highest contrast and the highest resolution planes. And it uh, works out really well. I've used it quite a bit. Um, good. What are the, what are, uh, let's see, from Shane, we have, what are the state of the science software programs that you are keeping your eye on? Um, I'm not paying a huge amount of attention. I'm primarily, primarily looking at imaging software, and I have a subscription to Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom that, and some other programs that are always, that are always current. Uh, I mentioned Holosun software that that is uh, excellent. I'm not watching a whole bunch of other things at this point. What uh, from Ed? He's asking, what is your experience with compensating defective pixels in the imaging chip or defects in the lens system? Um, If I if I have a, a, a defective pixel, if it's simply one pixel, I can simply clear that up in Photoshop. Um, generally speaking, I'm not working at such a, a level of magnification that a single pixel would alter the state of the image, other than creating a tiny red spot in my in my uh, 
in my final image. Uh, in, in really noisy images, which can happen, you can also do a, a subtraction. Uh, it's a little bit of trouble, and I don't usually use that, but it can work. Okay, uh, from Jacqueline, regarding line sequence determination, have you been successful in establishing which line or inked of inked entries was written over or under the other line? Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, that is a very difficult question in in in. Uh, uh, in line sweep sequence determination, it's a lot easier if you're dealing with, with say something like ballpoint pen over, over laser printing or that sort of thing. You can sometimes, depending on the depth of the, of the uh, uh, of the writing, and uh, of the two writings and how they cross over one another, sometimes you can tell the sequence, uh, but it's a it's an area where you want to be very conservative in your analyses. Thank you. OK, uh, question from Hugh. How can I prepare a clean cross-section for analysis of layered structure, such as film, a film laminated structure? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, too. Uh, it depends on, the, on the, the subject matter. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, when you say film laminated structure, it reminds me of a project that I did with Macron uh, where we had to look at garbage bag layering, uh, plastic garbage bag layering. That was a very difficult uh, specimen preparation problem, and it was handled by our, our clean room, who um, they, they basically use liquid nitrogen uh, to make a very stiff thing and then break it and we, with that clean edge we were able to do some very good imaging um, but that's a that can be difficult uh, with paint films it's not a problem because you can embed the the uh, a small paint film that is that is a uh, half a millimeter in diameter or so and uh, do a do a, a nice polish on that um, and then usually those are, are photographed at about 200 times magnification. OK, um, another question from a, a different hue. Um, have you performed scientific videography? And if so, do you have any tips on inclusion of scale? Um, I actually have not performed any scientific videography. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of inclusion of scale, I, certainly, the safest way to do that would be to include a physical scale within the frame, uh, so that whatever your whatever your video video uh, whatever your uh, um, videographing, it will always be there. Uh, if that's not completely possible, you might also if it, if everything is at the same magnification, you could do a separate image. And through video editing, you could include that video, uh, that scale, in every frame. Uh, but it, you would have to have constant magnification for that to be valid. OK. Can you read it? Uh, one for, more here from Ors Orsalia. Uh, can you tell us about a case from your related work which resulted in surprisingly different uh, results, I guess, compared to what you had expected. Hmm. Um, every project I enter, I enter every project with with the expectation of I don't know what I'm going to get, but I'm open to whatever wherever the data leads me. Uh, and it's any kind of bias is really important and can be can be can be difficult to to see in yourself. Uh, I I know that I am biased in in various ways, and I always try to suppress that that. Uh, so I 
oftentimes in my reports will be will try to be careful to to express my any opinions uh, very carefully. I you know any conclusions have to be have to be uh, completely validated, uh, and if if there's any doubt that that doubt must be must be uh, said made very clear. That's a really good question, uh, and I can't think of any particular case uh, where I can give you a, a short synopsis. But but certainly that has happened. That. Uh, you never know what you're going to get, and and uh, you, sometimes you're absolutely delighted with your results, uh, and other times it's you scratch your head and say, well, "I wonder where we're going to go to from here." Good. That does it for the questions. Thank you again for attending today's webinar. Please visit macron.com for a schedule of our future webinars.